Can I remind all members, please, on entering and leaving the chamber to be aware of physical distancing. And the next item of business is debate on COVID-19 next steps communities. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Aileen Campbell to speak to and move the motion for up to 12 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm delighted to be leading this debate alongside the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and older people. Each of us across the Chamber is acutely aware of the traumatic and harsh effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Every person across the country has had their lives changed and their way of life rocked. And as the time living with restriction turns from days to weeks to months, so too do the social economic harms grow. And as is so often the case, those impacts have not been felt equally. With those shielding, those that are marginalised, those living in poverty and experiencing disadvantage feeling the most pain. Moreover, we have also unfortunately seen a range of specific and disproportionate impacts on people with caring responsibilities, particularly women, lone parents, older people, disabled people, minority ethnic communities and children and young people. Because of COVID's unequal impact, it is critical that we work hard to ensure equality, human rights and social justice are at the heart of our response. Therefore, maintaining and developing a coordinated approach which addresses the often multiple experiences of poverty and inequality in people's lives will be central to our ability to respond successfully and to the challenges that we will face. It will also support our wider ambitions such as reducing child poverty and will align with our national performance framework which embeds our human rights led approach and our focus on well-being, fairness and outcomes. So for this debate, presiding officer, we aim to update the Parliament on the work undertaken to date, work that has been hallmarked by remarkable partnerships across the public, private, third sector and our communities. Work that has happened across the country against a devastating backdrop that has generated huge social gains with remarkable speed and resolve. And through that partnership and our discussions, what is clear is the palpable desire to continue working differently do not accept the inevitability of poverty or inequality, but instead use this pivotal moment to do more than help the country recover, but to also renew, reform and reimagine, to build back better and to do so together. Presiding officer, the oft used word to describe COVID-19 has been unprecedented and it required and still requires our response to be unprecedented in order to meet the monumental scale of the pandemic challenge head on. Our total commitment to additional expenditure, including for the NHS, has been worth around £3.8 billion. And on the 18th of March, I announced a £350 million package of support for communities to ensure local authorities, communities and the third sector are able to support those most affected. This included a third sector resilience fund that has so far provided over £20 million to nearly 1,100 organisations to help stabilise and manage cash flows over this difficult period, with over 12,000 jobs saved to date. A supporting communities fund that is currently investing in 356 organisations and communities across Scotland with spend over 14 million up to this point. And a wellbeing fund allocating over 25 million pounds to date through around 2,000 awards to third sector organisations up and down the country that are supporting communities in need at this time. And we continue to manage these funds flexibly to ensure the best possible response to the crisis, including cutting through red tape and getting money to where it's needed most across Scotland. This funding has reached every part of Scotland, supporting community groups and third sector organisations, mobilise their local resilience plans, tackle isolation and loneliness and provide direct sustenance to those that are struggling. The range and variety of what this funding has delivered is phenomenal and shows our communities at their inspirational best. And I want to thank every single organisation and volunteer who has responded to this pandemic and kept people safe, connected, fed and well. So to show where this support is reaching, I have today published a series of maps setting out our investment across the country, which gives the detail and information needed to illustrate what I have described. Throughout, we have worked in close partnership with businesses, local authorities and the wider public sector and the third sector, each stepping up to respond to the pandemic. In the case of Firstport, SCVO, Cora, Social Investment Scotland, Just Enterprise, Inspiring Scotland, the Hunter Foundation and third sector interfaces in every local authority are helping us set up systems and distribute the funding and we are sincerely grateful to them for that collected effort. 
And I'd also like to thank all of our partners helping us deliver the Supporting Communities Fund. From the start of this pandemic, access to food though has been a concern for many and we have actioned a blend of different approaches in order to deliver the support where it's needed and how it is needed. Our £70 million food fund has made sure all those in the shielding group can get the food they need while they have to self-isolate. Fair Share has distributed over 1,440 tonnes of food, equivalent to almost 3.5 million meals since the 23rd of March. It's also supported others at risk from the virus or who are struggling financially, including families eligible for free school meals, with support for authorities delivering over 175,000 children with a free school meal provision. But importantly, there has been a collective desire within the crisis response to not ditch the dignity. Our cash first approach to food insecurity is providing people with the money they need to buy the food they want to eat and is guided by the principles of human rights. And that's one of the reasons why through the Communities Funding Package, we have also more than doubled the Scottish Welfare Fund to help people in crisis. Affordable and adequate housing is also a key component of a socially just Scotland. With regards to tackling homelessness, the pandemic has shown what is possible when we adopt an urgent, inclusive and human rights based approach. Intelligence from our outreach services show that there are no more than 30 people sleeping rough across Scotland. The willingness of all parties to come together to move hundreds of people from the streets, night shelters and hostels into a place of safety has strengthened our resolve and shown us new paths to end homelessness in Scotland. We believe that no one should return to unsuitable temporary accommodation or rough sleeping once the crisis ends. And our ambition is to capitalise on the unique opportunity we have to secure settled homes for those currently in emergency accommodation. And we want to prevent increases in homelessness among those who may, for example, experience a drop in household income or family breakdown. And that's why I'm delighted that John Sparks of Crisis has agreed to reconvene Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group for a short time to guide us through the next crucial phase. Turning to the pri private rented sector, we took immediate action through the first coronavirus emergency legislation to ensure we increase the notice period a private landlord must give a tenant to six months. We've been clear that no landlord should evict a tenant because they have suffered financial hardship due to coronavirus and expect all landlords in both the social and private sector to be flexible with tenants facing financial hardship and signpost them to the resources of financial support. In addition to the second emergency coronavirus bill, we are also introducing private landlord pre-action protocols to introduce a series of steps a landlord should comply with when seeking to end a tenancy and will support private landlords and tenants to work together to manage any rent arrears caused as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. We also substantially increased the budget for other discretionary housing payments from 11 million to 16 million pounds, in addition to continuing to mitigate the bedroom tax in full. So, presiding officer, this is a snapshot highlighting examples of significant changes in policy and practice. People have rolled up their sleeves, focused on the tasks in hand, and in the process, kept folks safe and protected but they've also transformed lives and set in place new and better ways of working that we do not want to lose. In quick time, what we have seen is what we already know works, that person-centered, place-based, holistic support that understands and addresses the needs of the individual, the family and the household can deliver positive results. The pandemic response has necessitated that Scottish Government and our partners challenge traditional ways of working, cultures and mindsets. And so to create a post-pandemic Scotland that is fairer and equal, we need to capture what worked well, work out what more needs to be done, and also use this space to reform and renew what we do. The framework for decision-making on COVID-19 explicitly stated that this will mean upholding the principles of human dignity, autonomy, respect, and equality. And this will underpin the programme of work that Shirley Ann Somerville and I will take forward as we emerge from the lockdown restrictions and take the first steps towards <coughs> social renewal. Presiding officer, much of what we are seeing in action are policy approaches that we all know work, delivering outcomes we have been endeavouring to achieve for some time. Empowered communities, person-centred and holistic services, a focus on prevention and disregarding boundaries echo the recommendations of Campbell Christie from nine years ago. So we're not starting from scratch, but the challenges 
are, that are here are significant. The economic harms are ramping up rapidly. Our services are suffering from austerity. More folk are recognising and experiencing the insecurity of the welfare safety net that has endured cuts and reform. And we're having to learn how to live with this virus. Working together and working differently and ensuring those with direct lived experience can hold a mirror up to our actions has never been more important. And that is why on the 2nd of June, we convened an initial round table with key stakeholders to help shape and steer this work. And that was an honest, frank and rewarding conversation to help us on the path towards social renewal. But we don't want that to be the end of the dialogue. And I'm pleased to inform the Chamber today that following that discussion, Shirley Ann Somerville and I will bring together a social renewal advisory board that, will be jointly, that we will jointly convene to help us drive the cross portfolio working that is required. The board will contain representatives from a broad range of backgrounds and sectors with experience and knowledge of areas such as poverty, equality, disability, homelessness and regeneration. And I'm pleased that in amongst those agreeing to be part of the board, we are pleased to welcome Neil McEnoy from the Centre for Local Economic Strategies, John Sparks, as I've already mentioned, from Crisis, Emma Rich from Engender and Satwat Raymond from One Parent Family Scotland. Learning from the model set by the National Advisory Council on Women and Girls, the board will also work through a series of policy circles, each tasked to work at pace on recommendations and solutions to a specific policy theme, linking to established groups such as the Poverty and Inequality Commission and the Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group to avoid duplication and reinventing the wheel when we don't need to. Moreover, we want to ensure that those with lived experience are at the heart of discussions and we will support people to engage effectively and as local authorities are responsible for providing some of our most valued services and our critical partners in response to COVID-19, COSLA and SOLACE will be represented on the advisory board too. So, presiding officer, this pandemic has touched all our lives and it has changed how we live. It has been and continues to be harsh and horrible and has devastated those that have lost loved ones. Though in amongst this pain, there have been moments of inspiration and achievement to help sustain our country's recovery. Communities reconnecting with one another, a reappreciation of localism, rough sleeping drastically reduced, communities empowered and confident, and a desire to reevaluate what really matters. That spirit and this parliament can work towards creating a response to this pandemic that dismisses the I been attitude and instead embraces innovation, rights, equality, and fairness. It will be challenging, it will be difficult and it will be bumpy, but the opportunity for us all is significant and we want to engage with the Parliament on this agenda. So I look forward to today's conversation and debate and I move the motion in my name. Thank you. Which there's not one. <laughs> and there's not one. <laughs> I now call on Dame Simpson for up to seven minutes, please. Thank you. Um, um, there isn't even a motion to second. So, um, it's, it's fitting that we're having this debate in Carers Week, for the pandemic has shone a light on people who have been unsung for too long. I hope that once this is over, we'll treat our carers better and that those in our care homes will not be forgotten about. It's been a hidden sector and that can't continue. During Carers Week, we have a host of events in Lanarkshire, online, of course, this morning, there was a workshop teaching key life skills to tackle low moods and stress. We had a lunchtime cuppa and meditation session. And later, the superb Cumbernauld Living Landscape team will be telling people how the great outdoors can improve your life physically and mentally. An appreciation of the outdoors has been one of the good things to come from lockdown. Now, I've had such an appreciation since boyhood, sparked by some great outdoor learning experiences at school uh, and I hope we put greater value on that as we emerge from lockdown. The pandemic has given many of us cause to reflect on how things could change for the better. MSPs were asked by Holyrood magazine how the lockdown had affected their mental health. My answer was that for me it's actually been quite uplifting in many ways. The weather's been good, I've had more exercise than I've had in many years. I've been out on my bike and done more miles on it than I've probably ever done. And I've seen parts of Lanarkshire that I hadn't been to before. I've seen lots of people out and about who would otherwise have been indoors or in their cars. And I hope they keep it up because they'll have seen areas near their homes that they didn't know 
were there. I'm lucky, presiding officer, I've got a bike and I'm lucky that I've got a nice but small garden. And my family value that more than ever. But not everyone's so lucky, and that's made me think. Our garden may be small, but it's bigger than most plots you would get with a new house now. We need to see the value of the outdoors, and we need to provide for that. So when we come to dealing with National Planning Framework 4, then space for people should be at the forefront of our thinking. And we must protect what green spaces we have. I would argue that we must put in greater protections for green corridors, woods, areas around rivers and canals. I've always said that we need more homes, but they need to be in the right places. On my travels, on my bike, I've seen how my own town, East Kilbride, has grown massively in recent years, but in a piecemeal way, with no facilities, boxes plonked in fields, leaving other fields that you just know will end up with more boxes on them, soulless, all about the bottom line. We must do better. Many of the places I've seen and the cycle routes I've been on require public money to maintain them. I support the government's £30 million investment in temporary active travel infrastructure, but we need to ensure that pop-up cycle lanes are not popped out again later. Much of the heavy lifting during this crisis is being done by councils. Now, there's been a great hoo-ha about money owed to councils. Those of us in opposition have rightly criticised Kate Forbes for not paying councils the £155 million in consequentials that they were owed until, until she started paying in instalments last week. <laughs> Miss Forbes... Miss Forbes said last week she's still waiting for the consequentials to arrive from the UK government. And if that's the case, then they should get a move on. Something that I've also called on Kevin Stewart to do when it comes to the housing market. It's not personal, but the housing market has crashed. There were more than 6,000 house sales in Scotland in February and just 103 in April, normally the busiest month of the year. We need to let estate agents operate again safely, allow viewings, allow surveyors to work, and we need to allow the construction industry to restart. They have a safe working plan in place. They need to be allowed to get on and operate. They need a date. That in itself would also see the pipeline of suppliers get back up and running, and it could see those 6,000 families whose homes are nearly complete get into them and start building new communities. Housing should be, yes. Kevin Stewart. I, I, I thank uh, Mr Simpson for giving way. Um, and first of all, can I compl compliment him on his comments about National Planning Framework 4? Uh, and I think we also need to look at building standards too uh, as we move forward uh, to ensure that we're building the right homes and creating the right places uh, in light of this pa pandemic. Can I just say um, to Mr Simpson, um, I've worked constructively uh, with the construction industry as we have moved forward uh, to create a phase plan. I recognise that many folk are waiting for a date, but that date will be dictated by the virus. Uh, we hope to move shortly, but we have got to do that safely. And we have to recognise that in other places um, there have been situations where those involved in the construction industry um, have uh, faced great difficulties uh, in terms of the virus, uh, including deaths from the virus. And we have got to get this absolutely right. A date will come, uh, but that has to be done uh, when we ensure that everything is safe. Uh, can, I, can I say to the Chamber that interventions are not for speeches, and we're very short of time this afternoon. Mr Simpson. Um, I, well, I, I do, do hope you'll make some allowance for that. Um, I, I think there's a judgment involved here, uh, and I think the First Minister has made a judgment. Um, I would urge her to go a bit quicker. Housing should be at the heart of rebuilding our society. And research today shows we should all commit to building 53,000 affordable homes over the course of the next Parliament. And of course, we've fallen behind due to the pandemic, so we may need even more than that. It seems to me that all parties should be able to coalesce around a figure and not get into a bidding war as we go into the next Scottish Parliament elections. 
We must also look after those without a permanent home. We cannot, as Shelter Scotland have said, accept a return to the previous situation of families and individuals living in unsuitable temporary accommodation and vulnerable people sleeping on Scotland's streets. We have an opportunity to end rough sleeping for good and provide proper, decent accommodation for everyone who needs it. So I was glad to see Kevin Stewart reform the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group. Well done to him. No one should be left behind as we emerge from this crisis. We must look after the worst off and consider, as the Poverty Alliance have said, using the welfare tools at our disposal. Now, a number of things have been kicked into the long grass by government. The latest was an update on child poverty. There's no excuse for this. If it makes for uncomfortable reading, then so be it. We must face up to the realities. If we're to emerge stronger, hiding away won't cut it. Uh, before I move on, can I apologise to the Cabinet Secretary? It is indeed uh, uh, there's no motion today that's been debated. I'm a creature of habit and automatically came out with a phrase. And it was nice to see I was obeyed so readily. <laughs> and we move on, please, to Pauline McNeill for up to six minutes. Thank you for clearing that up, Presiding Officer. There has been nothing like it in our lifetime, and there will be nothing like it in the time to come as we plan the way forward. And we know that we will be picking up the pieces of the pandemic for years and probably decades to come, but hopefully not. The lockdown has thrown up so many different aspects of life in isolation. Uh, many friends talk of having quality time, as Graham Simpson has talked about, but at the same time, uh, worried for their jobs. And those who are at work are worried about travelling to work, worried about their health. And as we know, key workers are actually risking their lives for all of us in the NHS. But the COVID-19 has also exposed the existing deep-rooted inequalities in our communities, women, BME communities, and the fragility of low and insecure work. Our fellow BME citizens are often on the front line in the NHS. They are particularly at high risk of the virus. I know the First Minister announced the working group today, which I wholeheartedly welcome, but we need answers on why that is the case. There have been good news stories throughout the crisis, and it has been quite remarkable how numerous community groups across the country have stepped in. In my own patch in Glasgow, G13, G14 have been distributing food parcels and giving mental health support with teachers and young people helping out. The general public have been utterly amazing at the donations. I hope this continues. I believe it will. One word of warning must go out to my home city of Glasgow, where the where the local authority has scrapped £23 million fund to the third sector and community organisations. And there is a worry that we'll see redundancies in that sector in the coming weeks. We see the work community centres are doing and the third sector. We must continue to support them. We don't fully know the costs of the pandemic, but socially or economically. Uh, but I would like to say in this debate to Cabinet Secretary and Ministers, we need big ideas, not old solutions. This is the time to be bold. And Labour gives a commitment. We will work with the government on that. Some house households have been able to save during the lockdown, but many others have struggled to make ends meet. Debt will be a huge issue for millions who will have to resort to borrowing, and there must be a cap on interest rates in the high street too. As I've said before, we could face mass evictions at the end of the protected period, and I believe the Scottish Government must there raise their ambitions to help renters survive. My fair rents bill has now been lodged. I hope the government will open their minds to a new way of thinking on that. And today, Shelter and the Chartered Institute um, of Housing and the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations have announced a really important document about the importance of affordable homes. I hope we can get a commitment from all parties in the next parliament that there will be a commitment to mass building of affordable homes. Yesterday, there were newspaper reports that many people have died of COVID-19 at home alone, and some weren't discovered for up to two weeks. Unfortunately, there has been an increase of people dying of other diseases as well. The head of the Royal College of GPs, Professor Martin Marshall, said, we are noticing an increase in people dying in the community, often at home, and often due to conditions unrelated to COVID-19, such as cardiac arrest. As all the parties have said in this chamber, we must begin to plan the work soon to get our NHS back on track. 
Doctors say that most of the cases involve older people living alone and others, the person who has died has a mental health condition such as schizophrenia or depression. Our treatment of older people has been a test for our society right now and I do think there are some aspects of that have been wanting. I want to spend my last minute or so talking about the age group of 16 to 24 because I do believe that they are amongst the biggest losers in the crisis. They are twice as likely um, to lose their jobs in the types of employment um, that they are found in. Um, I'm hugely concerned for the shielded group. I want to address this question of the shielded young people. I raised this with the First Minister last week. Sitting at home while their chances for work and opportunities pass them by. Now, in answer, in answer today to a parliamentary question when I asked about this vulnerable group, the answer I got, I felt, was an old solution. And I really hope ministers listen to this. Skills Development Scotland have a new fund. This is all good. But if you consider most young people that you know, how many of them know that Skills Development Scotland exists? Do they have the first clue how to get in touch with them? Why well, I ask ministers, if you're really serious about getting bold about this and being radical, why can't the government seek to contact every young shielded person because they've all been written to? Why can't there be some direct contact with them to see what they need in terms of skill and training? I, I really want to engage with ministers on this. My niece said that she was interviewed for a place on a course while she was organising dinner for the family. She was asked two questions that she thought were rather odd. This is the course that she wanted to go on. She's the career we're talking about. She was refused a place, no course of appeal, no contact from the college. And another constituent today asked for an advance on his rent because of a house that he could have moved into today or tomorrow. And they've refused um, his advance and because he said, I'll pay it back when I get a job. He doesn't know when that's going to be. Uh, these are the real stories out there right now, and there's thousands of them. I'm happy to go away. I'm conscious of time, and uh, I, I recognise the, the points that Colleen McNeill has made, and I'll endeavour to make sure that we raise them and engage those really, I think, reasonable, pragmatic, actually, uh, suggestions and make sure we raise them with the right minister. But I also think the point that she makes is really important, which is what I addressed in my opening remarks about the stories of lived experience, about people's experience of services, that we need to make sure that we don't just get the same old folk round the same old tables. We need to make sure that lived experience also ensures that we uh, that influence and guide our approach going forward. So I would agree uh, much uh, with... Of that was hardly quite Cabinet Secretary. You'll need to close now, Ms McNeill. <laughs> If I could put on record, presiding officer, that, that's, that are the kind of answers that Labour is looking for, that you will listen to radical ideas. If I could say this in closing, presiding officer, I will close, because I did want to say this. Big companies and supermarkets must pay in. They have been doing well out of the pandemic. They must continue to support communities. And I just wanted to close with this quote. It's from a colleague of mine, Dave Watson, who blogged for Commonweal. If we are going to build back better, we need to create a common understanding of how the pandemic had exposed the failures of our economy and democracy and develop the ideas to fix it. Many thousands of our citizens are dying from a virus. We should make, it should make us all think about what we want from our society. I don't think it's overly philosophical to suggest that the answer is not more greed and acquisition, but rather sufficiency and security. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, before I go any further, can I... Um give due notice that we're well out of time. Um, it's either that decision time will be made later or speeches will be cut in their timing. Uh, call Andy Whiteman, six minutes, please. Thanks, Presiding Officer. And I want to th start by thanking all the community organisations across Scotland, the charities, voluntary groups, local government and social enterprises for their extraordinary efforts over the past uh, two months in supporting uh, communities. Uh, as we well know, the virus has exposed existing inequalities. Uh, with women, minority ethnic and the young being disproportionately affected by the social and economic impact uh, of the virus. And this is a, a structural issue as most of these groups are often employed at the most at risk jobs, are poorly rewarded and have the least security in relationship to the housing and the job market. Now, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and the heightened awareness of police violence and racism more generally, I want to highlight the particular impacts of COVID-19 uh, and deaths amongst the black and ethnic minority populations. Not, it appears, because of any biological predisposition, but because of structural inequality and, yes, racism. In Scotland, uh, Bemis has been doing valuable work through its Ethnic Minorities National Resilience Network, responding to the many and varied challenges affecting black, Asian, Roma and other ethnic groups. I know this work has been supported by the Scottish Government, but I was concerned that they had to suspend their emergency sustenance grant fund in mid-May. Until the closure of this grant, Bemis had distributed 32,000 pounds 
£32,170 to 806 people in total, 391 adults and 415 children and young people. Despite a request for more support, BMS has not yet had uh, any confirmation and I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to confirm whether indeed ongoing support will be available for this vital uh, programme. Presiding officer, the question of housing is central to this pandemic and has already featured in members' contributions. People are being instructed to stay at home. Indeed, it is a criminal offence to leave the place where you are living without a reasonable excuse. And it's clear that growing numbers of private tenants face growing insecurity. A recent study by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation last week showed that 30% of furloughed private renters are worried about being able to pay their rent. This is across the UK. 42% of private renters have already seen their income decrease uh, due to the impact of the coronavirus and the latest information from Scotland is 31% of private renters are very or fairly concerned about paying rent. And across the UK, 63% of private renters do not have any savings. The Jules Rentry Foundation goes on to make clear that renters must be offered real protection from eviction and the current emergency provisions are obviously welcome but they are time limited. From July onwards, the Housing and Property Chamber is planning on restarting case management discussions online. Case management discussions can and often do lead to evictions. So tenants who've spent their, their pandemic with an eviction notice hanging over their heads issued before it can now be evicted. On the 6th of October, eviction notices issued during the pandemic, because of course the eviction ban was an extension of the notice period and not a ban, will begin their journey through the courts if this provision is not extended. Also in October, if the provision is not extended, the grounds for eviction temporarily made discretionary by the Coronavirus Act will be mandatory again. This means that the Housing and Property Chamber must evict tenants who have been in arrears for three months or more. Now, people are facing immense financial insecurity and high rents, and they will inevitably face eviction. All of this has the potential to cause a tidal wave of evictions. Now, the Scottish Government and the third sector have done excellent work on homelessness, and I welcome the re-establishment uh, of the Homelessness Task Force. But all that work could well be undone. So I return to the issues that I raised in the Coronavirus Bill debate on the 20th of May, and would appeal to ministers to reconsider their approach to this issue. Even the Tory government in London has gone further, as announced last Friday by the Master of the Rules. Tenants need a new deal to ensure that their human rights to a home are upheld, not only during the emergency, but beyond it as well. This is about giving certainty to landlords as well as to tenants. The Chartered Institute of Housing, as Pauline McNeill mentioned, has called for no evictions as a result of coronavirus arrears. So we do need additional legislative protections for tenants principally ensuring that rent arrears arising during the emergency and as a consequence of COVID-19 cannot by law be grounds for eviction. But we can do more as well. Even if the law were to be changed, those arrears would remain debts. They'd remain debts that were payable and that we'd need dealt with in time. And we need a solution to this. For example, credit unions could leverage their funds to lend to tenants in distress those tenants could enter into a binding agreement with their landlord for revised payment terms over, say, two years. Monies would be paid into tenants' credit union account in a lump sum and then paid to the landlord according to that agreed plan while the tenant earned interest on the funds. The government could underwrite, uh, a provide a guarantee, for example, 10% uh, of that loan amount. This would provide a safety net for tenants and landlords underwritten by government and is the kind of scheme that ministers have the powers to initiate, to develop and promote in partnership with tenants unions, credit unions and landlords. Now these are not radical suggestions but real workable ideas that people are bringing to the Scottish Government. But the starting point must remain this, nobody, nobody should be evicted from their home as a result of coronavirus, either during the emergency period or after it has expired. This is a public health imperative now, and it will remain a public health imperative after the emergency period. Now, I'm not interested in rehashing whether ministers have done enough up until now. I'm asking what they will do next to, provide, to prevent a perfect storm of housing insecurity in a few months. Presiding officer, I conclude by commending everyone in our communities who are responding to this crisis. And that includes Scottish ministers, local government and public services. But I also want to stress how vital it is to build back security into people's lives. Security in housing, energy, food costs and incomes. And urge the government to introduce a new settlement for a post-COVID age. Thank you. Alex Cole Hamilton, up to six minutes, please. <coughs> 
Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I rise today to speak from two particular van vantage points. Uh, the first as chair of the cross-party group on volunteering and as a volunteer myself. The well-being of our community's presiding officer is exactly why I got into politics, so I'm very grateful to the government for making time available for this important debate today. Presiding officer, since the start of this emergency, I've attended 77 coffee mornings from the edge of my driveway. We live in a small six-house cul-de-sac in West Edinburgh, and at 11am every morning, rain or shine, everyone stops what they're doing for a coffee break and meets for 20 minutes around the edge of our grove. More recently, we've extended that to a Friday night pub quiz. This virus has made firm friends of each of us, and together we have supported two of our six households through COVID-19 infection, running errands and offering other forms of help and advice. We were friendly beforehand, but this is creating a lasting bond that I'm incredibly grateful for, and which has sustained each of us through the privations of lockdown. Presiding officer, there'll be stories like ours the country over. Communities are at the very heart of this emergency. Uh, they are where the impact of this virus is most keenly felt, but they are also in the front line in the mitigation of that impact. I've said before that in all of my life, I don't remember a time I felt more scared that in those first days of the crisis. I remember working late into the evening in the constituency office shortly before lockdown, trying to deal with a torrent of emails for those about to lose their livelihoods and go under, when a member of the local community council stopped in with a bottle of wine. It is a, meaningful, a million seemingly tiny acts of human kindness like this which have defined the community response to this awful time for me. Indeed, the Prime Minister had barely finished announcing the restrictions of lockdown on the 23rd of March when the mutual aid groups started springing up. And all told, there are now some 300 such groups serving nearly every single community in this country. They do so much more than hang up my mother's washing or get the shopping in for friends in shielding. They offer human contact and encouragement to those left most isolated by the virus. They deserve the heartfelt thanks of this chamber and our lasting pride. On top of the mutual aid groups, we can see the response of the private sector. In my own constituency, businesses like Jill's Deli, the Torfin Pub, Abida Indian Takeaway and the Chinese Manor House, all delivering hot, free and safely prepared meals to those shielding or in self-isolation with COVID-19 symptoms. Cafe Vigo recently delivered 150 filled rolls to the COVID hub at the Western General to grateful clinicians. The list goes on and on and on. We should all be proud of the philanthropy of those businesses, despite in some cases facing pretty catastrophic financial outlooks themselves. They have stood shoulder to shoulder with the most vulnerable people in our community and presiding officer. Our community will remember that kindness and I hope very much that the government will, will remember that kindness too in the support it offers them in the months to come. But beyond the good offices of local business has been the response of the third sector. And I want to single two charities out in particular, the Kustorfen Community Centre, who delivers food parcels across West Edinburgh, while the Scran Academy, which many members know about, delivered their 50,000th meal to those in isolation across the city of Edinburgh. And it has been the privilege of my life to volunteer among them for the, at least two evenings a week throughout lockdown. A fortnight ago, I reached my own milestone, delivering my thousandth meal to someone, uh, to people isolating with COVID-19 symptoms. Presiding officer, that experience of driving meals all over West Edinburgh has given me a real insight into how our communities are faring and what we need to do to support them going forward. There is such resilience out there a common understanding as to why these restrictions have been needed and a steadfast observance of those rules. People are learning to live around the virus, but also to support each other in so doing in a way that nobody could have ever imagined. And presiding officer, we're gonna need more of that. Since the start of this crisis, according to the Scottish Food Coalition, food bank usage has surged by 300%. We are well into this crisis, but its full impact has yet to take hold. Furlough and the self-employed grant have staved off the worst of the economic hardships of COVID, but that cannot last forever. And if the suggestion is that across the UK we could see more than 3 million job losses after JRF concludes, mm -hmm. then the social and economic consequences of the recession to come will need resilience in our communities like never before. We're going to have to look to our communities to help provide solutions on issues like mental health, social isolation, trauma recovery, 
We know that loneliness increases death by 26%, and presiding officer, that is far more acute now than it has ever been before. Housing also has been mentioned several times in this debate, and that has to be an absolute priority, because when unemployment rises, homelessness is sure to follow. And before the COVID-19 outbreak, Scotland, and I need not remind the Chamber of this fact, had the worst de death rate for the homeless in the United Kingdom. And while 97% of rough sleepers are being accommodated, we, have, we understand that hotels are now set to close their doors to the homeless at the end of June. The risk is that we slide back into rough sleeping and also that our efforts to contain the virus uh, will be hampered by, uh, by such a, a, a return to rough sleeping. Again, consideration of what we must do here must be folded into our community response. I'll close with this, presiding officer. The American writer Margaret Wheatley said that there is no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. This virus has shown to me what our communities care about. They are aware the problems and the pain of this emergency and its aftermath will be most manifest, but they're also where we will find the solutions. Thank you. Move to the open debate and its speeches of six minutes, please. James Dornan, followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Although there have been encouraging signs over the last few days, this pandemic can often appear to be unrelenting. That's why I'm grateful to have the opportunity to discuss the next steps for our communities, just as we've recently started the careful and gradual easing of our lockdown restrictions. Many of the challenges caused by the coronavirus will continue to impact the public in the coming weeks and months, particularly those who have been asked to shield to the end of July or those who have sadly lost their jobs or, more importantly, loved ones. Whilst new problems and obstacles will emerge as we continue with our tentative steps to recover and renew. The World Health Organisation and their strategy for transition emphasise that communities have a voice, are informed, engaged and participatory in the transition. And I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to enable just that. Signing officer, at the beginning of the coronavirus emergency, the Scottish Government introduced the £350 million fund to allow councils, charities, businesses and community groups to respond to the situation swiftly and according to local need. And has already been mentioned, there's a £70 million food fund, £50 million wellbeing fund and a £40 million supporting communities fund. Groups working in the heart of our communities have a wealth of experience in responding to different local and national challenges. And the funding available has been a valuable lifeline to those who need help most. I was delighted to learn that a number of housing associations which operate in my constituency, including Arden, Arden Glen, Govan Hill and Thenew Housing Associations, have benefited from this Scottish Government funding, each of which are at the front line in local efforts to combat the virus. Throughout this pandemic, members will all have experienced an increase in their constituency caseload. The crisis has highlighted existing inequalities which have persistently persisted stubbornly over decades, and the harms caused by the pandemic are not felt equally. As we look to the future and our next steps, I think it's vitally important that we keep doing all we can to address some of these existing issues, as many of them will sadly persist or even worsen. I would like to take the opportunity to mention and praise a number of the community support groups in my constituency who are doing all they can to address some of the problems being faced. Cast them together, who are also beneficiaries of the Scottish Government Supporting Communities Fund, have been dropping off food parcels to households with children. Kojak are delivering care services for key workers. Pan is delivering food across Port Shaws, Mansfield, Hill Park and Eastwood Estate. And just over my constituency boundary, the Dixon Centre, who do a lot of work with many of my constituents, is making daily calls and supporting their elderly service users. These established organisations do great work and have done so before, even before the pandemic. But I also think it's worthwhile recognising and thanking the other less formal support networks that are out there and that have been helping thousands. Across my constituency, there are many community Facebook groups whose users are selflessly supporting each other, for example, through collecting prescriptions, delivering mail and dropping off essentials. So there's an incredible amount of support out there, in addition to the national phone line, which, as a reminder, can be contacted on 0800 111 4000. And I hope all those affected by this crisis have been able to access some form of assistance. Sign off, sir, the global COVID-19 pandemic has been heartbreaking and difficult for all of us. But if there's been one thing we can take as a small positive, it's the way our communities have pulled together and the way they have overcome institutional obstacles, in a way unlikely before the pandemic made it crucial. 
local carers, NHS and social care staff, local government, police and fire crews, local businesses, organisations, charities and volunteers, to name but a few, have come together like never before, ensuring that the most vulnerable people aren't left behind in our communities. Homeless is a perfect example of this, and I was delighted to see that John Spark from Crisis is going to be the leader in the homeless and, and rough sleeping working group, looking at how we build and what we've already achieved. It's a perfect example of non-silo working and a collaborative approach and all that can be achieved by that approach. It's become cl crystal clear to me during this crisis just how important a role the third sector has if we're to continue with the good work we've learned. They have the commitment, expertise, agility and flexibility to work in partnership with local government and the Scottish Government. Almost 10 years on from the Christie Commission on the future delivery of public services, we now have the opportunity to look at a different way of doing things and put in place the collaboration that was central to his vision. With the chance to move away from the institutional obstacles that so often impede progress, we have a chance to ensure that the person or community at need is everyone's priority and not just the bit that they themselves are responsible for. And yes, we do have the chance, finally, to get rid of, once and for all, the silo culture which has held us back for so long. These tough times bring out the best in people, and it's been truly inspirational to see how my constituents and people and constituents all across Scotland have worked together to try and defeat COVID-19. As we move on through and out of the crisis, we need to capture this incredible community spirit and build upon it for years to come. If we do that, and I've no doubt the Scottish Government will take that opportunity, we can chart a better way forward and support for all of the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Gordon. And I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The community resilience that has been shown during this coronavirus pandemic has nothing been short of remarkable. When forced with this terrible, invisible enemy that forced us into necessary lockdown, Families, friends, neighbours, colleagues, communities could have drawn further apart. Instead, communities have pulled closer together. They have supported uh, the most vulnerable in a society who require to shield. They have made sure that individuals have been supported, whether that was delivering prescriptions, collecting shopping, or enabling people uh, to be encouraged. And that must, Deputy Presiding Officer, be one of the best things we've seen from this terrible situation. And I have seen tremendous support across my own region of Mid-Scotland and Fife. In Bridge of Allen, the Carers Group, uh, a community resilience team was established and they created a community larder and that distributes food to individuals twice a week. In the Dollar community, the trust, uh, the community trust uh, stayed connected through Zoom. Uh, they had yoga, Pilates, singing, gardening, lunch clubs. Many organisations uh, uh, have, have benefited. In Alva, the resource and the resilience group have led together and ensured that communities could adapt to support individuals. And that has happened across Perth and Kinross, Stirling and Fife, also across my region. But many charities and third sector organisations may or will not survive during this pandemic. Funding has been set aside for them, but not all can be assisted and supported. We must therefore double our efforts to support and financially and emotionally support these organisations to thrive and survive. After Volunteers Week last week, this debate is another important opportunity for us to put on record our thanks to volunteers up and down the length and breadth of this country who give of their best to ensure that individuals are supported. It has always been my view that uh, communities know best, better than government, to ensure that individuals and communities can support one another. I think the examples I've given have shown that, Deputy Presiding Officer. In many cases, community groups were far quicker to organise themselves and to start helping people in need, both nationally and the volunteer sector. And that is to be welcomed. The fact that some of these uh, ensured that councils and support mechanisms were in place, but there were the occasions, Deputy Presiding Officer, where councils started trying to get involved, and that created some confusion. Uh, and that needs to be ironed out when we're dealing with issues like that. And I know, for example, uh, that it's difficult for many to hear that, but it's a fact uh, that we need to ensure that that broad base takes place. Uh, in many of these situations, the state can do the best it can by acting as an enabler of our communities rather than a direct deliverer of services. For governments across the United Kingdom, there have been undoubtedly very difficult decisions to be made. And we have seen and we've heard from many sectors across the community, but we're here to do the best we can to flatten uh, that coronavirus curve. 
But it is also very much the case that we have to ensure that there's a cost to what lockdown has enabled. And we don't yet know what that cost is, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, is it economic cost and a human cost? They are both there. Despite the enormous and unprecedented package of employment support provided by the UK Government and others to ensure that individuals kept their jobs, many people have lost their jobs and more people will lose them as we progress through this situation. And cutting off entire populations from loved ones for such an extended period of time was very likely to be detrimental to their mental health. These individuals were struggling enough at the present time to get support from communities across the NHS. So it's vitally important that we re-engage with these individuals to ensure that they get that support. And the steps that we're taking today are very much that. They're the steps out of this situation. They're the steps that will give us opportunities. And we have to support the existing groups and organisations. And that may mean a, a, a step change uh, to ensure that support is financial. We've always been amazed and impressed by the fact that a small amount of money into a situation locally can have a huge impact, an enormous impact in what can be achieved. Uh, and that needs to be the case. The whole idea about genuine partnership working has to be embraced. Uh, we must ensure that councils, health boards and public sector organisations work collectively together. It has happened during this pandemic. It needs to happen in the future. And as I've said, it's vitally important that we all organise and support to ensure that the best ways that happen. We do not want a top-down government knows best approach. Well, what we need to do is put the third sector in the driving seat to ensure that that is the best way we can move forward. This debate today has given us the opportunity of a snapshot of what has been achieved to date. Uh, funding has been provided, positive results have been identified, but reform needs to take place. We've empowered communities, we've worked together, we've seen cross-party and we've seen cross-portfolio uh, working across. So in, in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is with this approach, this mindset, that I believe we can best tackle the challenges that lie ahead. These challenges are considerable. When, I, when we let a community lead, the results speak for themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart, and I call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Anna Sarwar. Ms Maguire, please. Presiding officer, I was pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary reaffirm that as the focus now begins to move to recovery and renew phases, the Scottish Government aims to build on policy and practice changes that have shown the potential to be genuinely transformative. Um, I also welcomed um, the Cabinet Secretary's comments about the importance of lived experience. And with apologies if I missed this in your speech, I wonder if in summing up, you can say whether there will be any um, unpaid, unpaid carers or um, people with disabilities on the board of the advisory group. That would be helpful to know. Um, I agree there's an opportunity as we emerge from this period to chart a better way forward in support of all Scotland. Um, the Scottish Government and this Parliament must grab that opportunity with both hands. Cross-party working on the emergency legislation with productive, constructive scrutiny, coupled with unprecedented reprioritisation of resources and powers, have shown what can be done where there's a will to do it. As we plan a route through this crisis, we need that same will to tackle poverty, addiction and inequality. These things also threaten the lives of the citizens we represent. I've said before, as have many others, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. This health crisis has highlighted and in many cases exacerbated deep existing inequalities which have persisted stubbornly over the decades. The harms caused by the pandemic and the harms of the measures put in place to manage it and save lives are not felt equally and government responses should reflect that in making decisions. Fairness and quality of life for all our citizens must not only be considered, but also acted upon. Things that campaigners have been calling for for years, dignified food provision, accessible information, online classes, support with isolation, in a matter of weeks became mainstream. Presiding officer, six minutes doesn't give me enough time to mention all the wonderful volunteers and organisations in my Cunningham South constituency, but I want to say that I'm grateful to each and every one of them and just provide a snapshot of, of some good work that's going on. Fullerton Hub in my uh, hometown, Irvine, has 56 volunteers under the leadership of Donna, Sp Donna Fitzpatrick, and they're absolutely knocking their pans in seven days a week. 
They're doing dog walking and prescription pickup for those who are shielding. They're preparing and delivering 149 fresh meals a day from a very relatively small kitchen, good quality fresh cooked food for those sh shielding. And it's not just in Fullerton, they're helping people throughout Irvine. They're also providing personal shopping for older folk in the area. I think that's really important because some of what comes with dignity is actually having choice and, and it being a personal shopping um, service gives older people that choice. They decide what, what messages they're getting. Um, for those needing a helping hand in the community, there's always been a food larder at the centre, well, for sort of 10 months or so. At the moment, that's scaled up hugely and there are around 200 food parcels going out a week. Presiding officer, the economic and health challenges in my constituency have been there for a very long time, as has the resilience and strength of the community. I'm also conscious, though, that there'll be many more citizens who were managing, or just managing, who will be tipped into positions of debt as the economic impact of the pandemic um, is, is felt in our communities. Fullerton and other hubs in North Ayrshire have stepped up and provided for our community. They're at the heart of the community, indeed they are the community, and they know what's needed, and the priority is food and tackling isolation. They're delivering and have been since the very start of this crisis. Interestingly, they're also reaching folk who need support but have not had involvement with statutory services before, new connections that can literally be life-saving. I believe government funding should be getting as close as possible to local community groups, and these groups should be valued, trusted, and properly supported and resourced. I know the Third Sector Resilience Fund was designed to be flexible and cut down on red tape, and I should mention that in evidence to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, we heard some really positive feedback about that funding and the ease of application. But I also have a local example of that not being the case, which I'll share with the CABSEC if that's okay. Um, I was also struck by ev evidence from Radiant and Brighter to the committee that the lack of certainty around sustainable funding meant that they didn't actually apply. And I think I can understand why there might be a reticence around setting expectations of help that would only be met short term. And maybe we have to reflect on that, on the impact and potential harm of starting supports and interventions for at-risk people and then having to stop. We're a group have been demonstrably delivering lifeline support and meeting the needs of a community. They shouldn't have to start right back at the beginning in terms of proving their worth and knowledge and funding applications. And they shouldn't have to use their valuable resource, be that time or money, to secure the funding they need to continue. Politicians frequently call on groups like Fullerton Community Association to talk around the country about community empowerment. Um, none of us are ever shy about that, and rightly, our small groups and, and charities deserve praise. But in some ways, presiding officers, our communities don't need empowered in the sense of developing skills, a voice or knowledge. They have all that already. They are powerful. They need a fair distribution of resource. Let's show them with our actions as well as our words that we mean it. Scotland can be a fairer and more equal place for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Anna Sarwar to be followed by Annabel Yu. Mr Sarwar. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by, like other members have done, uh, thanking all those volunteers uh, right around the country who have uh, literally been out there to help save and protect lives uh, in terms of looking out for their neighbours, uh, looking out for their loved ones and looking out for other people in their wider community. Um, I should also declare an interest as a uh, trustee of a charity that has supported mutual aid groups across uh, the country. So to each and every single one of all those volunteers and all the organisations across the country, uh, a deep, deep thank you. Um, I just wanted to raise a, a few issues with the uh, Cabinet Secretaries uh, today um, in terms of as we enter the next phase of this response to the pandemic. Uh, and the first is to uh, mention how we are going to support third sector organisations. Uh, it's been referenced before uh, that there's a large scale of third sector organisations that are going to feel a massive impact in terms of their funding uh, having fallen through the ground. Uh, not just funding from government, I mean more particularly funding that's come from uh, the public or from institutions. Uh, how are we going to support those organisations so they're able to continue to support people in our communities is going to be really, really uh, important. So that's one part in terms of helping to deliver support. But actually there's a massive issue around financial exclusion 
and the charities that are involved in delivering services around financial exclusion, how we can give advice so people are able to maximise their incomes eh, at a time of an economic downturn. So I'd be keen to hear what support is going to be given around financial exclusion services eh, so they are getting the support eh, that they need so they can maximise their impact eh, and they can maximise individual households' eh, incomes. Eh, I'm also worried about the, the shielding eh, group um, and uh, this is not meant any um, criticism of government, far from it, uh, but I do worry about how we continue to communicate uh, with those that are in shielded categories, uh, how we open up a constructive dialogue with those uh, individuals about how they can try and get some normality back into their lives uh, whilst also protecting their health um, at the same time. Uh, we can argue and discuss and debate, and no doubt one day we will, about how prepared we were for uh, this viral pandemic but I think we can start making preparations for what is an inevitable pandemic that's going to follow this one, and that's a mental health pandemic. So what preparation are we making right now to support people's mental health, not just in the shielded category, but right, right across our society in response to this crisis? I also wanted to touch upon an area that Andy Whiteman covered, which is around support in particular for BME communities. I know the network that Andy refers to. It's one of the um, charities that we have um, supported through the network. Um, we need tailored support for BME communities because quite often there are individuals and families who are hard to reach and because they have those connections, those relationships, they're able to reach those families, identify those families. Um, so what support can that network be given uh, and then how can we further identify other individuals? Um, I welcome the fact that today we've had the announcement of a working group to look at the impact of uh, COVID-19 on BME communities. I must say there is a slight bit of frustration, while I welcome it, the slight bit of frustration, and that it has taken 10 weeks for us to get there in terms of having a working group looking at the impact on BME communities. We, I think we have been too slow and far behind other parts of the UK in terms of recording data, sharing data, and analysing data about the impact on BME communities. And I think that catch-up work now needs to happen in terms of that working group. I don't think that can just become something that takes a lot of time. I think we need to look at what that working group is going to do and the impact on BME communities and what that means in terms of service delivery, but also what it means for BME workers on the front line. Um, we've had a lot of discussion this week about um, racism. We will discuss uh, tomorrow in this parliament the issue of uh, racism. But I think it's important to note that very many people in this country uh, get their food made by BME communities, their food supplied by BME communities, their shops opened by BME communities, their shelves stocked by BME communities, their medicines and supplies delivered by BME communities, their diagnosis done by BME communities, and their treatment done by BME communities. And if those people can come and risk their lives to try and save lives in this country, then we owe it to them to adequately respond to this crisis, but also adequately respond after this crisis as well as we tackle inequality, much deeper, wider inequality, in our society. And that's the point I wanted to end on, Deputy Presiding Officer, is we can't return to the model that we've had in the past. There is no doubt that we're going to have an economic downturn through this pandemic and then after this pandemic. But if we have a repeat of the failed ideologies of the past, either of the 1980s when we had people put on the unemployment scrap heap, many of them never went on to work again, many of their families never went on to work, and we had structural, ingrained poverty into those communities as a result of that economic downturn in the 80s. If we have a repeat of what happened in the financial crash in the 2010s on order words in terms of austerity, we've got to recognise austerity costs lives as well. And if we have a repeat of those failed ideologies, then we will have more people losing their lives as a, as a consequence of the austerity of the economic downturn in the pandemic rather than the pandemic itself. So how are we going to challenge that structural inequality through into the next phase I've got 30 seconds left, so I'm going to use it, Deputy Presiding Officer, to make one final point, uh, which is around children. Um, th there are lots of children who, for them, respite was school. School was respite for them. And they haven't had that respite in the last three months. And now they're going to go into a school holiday period, meaning they're not going to have any respite for six months. What support are we going to put in place for those children across the country so they aren't being left behind um, and all the impacts that come from that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarwar. I call Annabel Ewing to be followed by Edwin Mountain. Ms. Ewing, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be called to speak in this debate this afternoon. And at the outset, I think it would be important to recognise the very significant 
Scottish Government support that has been made available to address emergency needs during the coronavirus pandemic. And indeed, we have heard that a financial package of £350 million Pounds was announced by the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Aileen Campbell, on the 18th of March. A very rapid response indeed, in recognition of the considerable disruption to people's lives that was coming down the line and the likely very significant financial hardship that would follow. This package included different strands of support to local authorities, to charities, to businesses and to community groups. And the watchwords have been flexibility and delivery on the ground and not bureaucracy and red tape. Some £95 million has been made available directly to local authorities, including a top-up of £45 million to the Scottish Welfare Fund. And in that regard, I, it would be helpful to hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security when winding up how the greater flexibility provided for with regard to the operation of the Scottish Welfare Fund has, in fact, been working in practice. We have also seen a £70 million food fund established to address the huge issues of food insecurity, a £50 million wellbeing fund, a £40 million supporting communities fund, and a £20 million fund for third sector resilience, helping therefore to ensure the continued viability of key third sector organisations affected by cash flow. And we've also seen a sum of £50 million uh, to go to meet an anticipated increase in applications both for the existing uh, Scottish Government uh, Council Tax Reduction Scheme and also Sc Scottish Social Security benefits. Again, it would be helpful to hear from the Cab Cabinet Secretary for Social Security in her closing remarks as to what level of drawdown uh, this 50 million sum has been subject to uh, thus far. Finally, it is to be noted that at the time of the announcement, uh, 25 million was to be kept in reserve to allow speedy and flexible action when needed to deal with the rapidly changing circumstances that we face. And again, it would be uh, helpful to hear where matters stand with that uh, uh, significant amount of reserve. Uh, although, of course, it may be that that has been subsequently applied to other important uh, funding streams. Uh, and in terms of the detail, yes, certainly. Cabinet Secretary. The, the reserves uh, have been, been spent most uh, recently. There has been the £5 million top up to the Third Sector Resilience Fund. So we increased that pot. Um, and again, we're kind of keeping an eye on all of those funds to make sure that we can deploy that resource in the best way possible. Uh, but in, also, in, uh, a point that was raised by Anna Sarwar, we're going to have to think pretty cleverly I about think how my, we support I think third my sector. colleague said no speeches or interventions. I do pay attention when I'm in the office. <laughs> Ms. Ewing, please. I thank you. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that intervention, which is very helpful, although I do note as a lawyer that there's still some money left. So we'll be watching that very closely, uh, as will my constituents in Cowdenbeath. Um, but it's very uh, uh, indeed welcome to note that this very significant Scottish fund, uh, Government funding has been made available so quickly. And I note from the detail published today that, in fact, uh, Fife has received uh, some £8,850,000 uh, and £125 worth of funding, which I think represents the third largest sum across Scotland. And in my constituency of Cowdenbeath, I know that um, Fife Voluntary Action has played a key role as a third sector interface for Fife, and I would wish to thank all at Fife Voluntary Action and indeed all volunteers across Fife for all that they have been doing to help assist people during the pandemic. There are just so many examples of individuals and communities stepping up to the plate, as we've heard already this afternoon, but that is the case also across every uh, part of my constituency from the Benarty Emergency Response Group, the Lochgelly Beat Corona uh, Group, the Wee Cafe in Kelty and the Each Resyth Community Hub. Uh, and in every single town and village in between, uh, we see a, a, a huge effort on the part of these very, very inspiring individuals. And a heartfelt thank you from me and I'm sure the whole chamber to all those individuals in my constituency. In the past uh, weeks of this first stage of the pandemic, a particular focus has been uh, quite rightly placed on the shielding group. Uh, with regard to the vulnerable group, I know um, from my constituency casework, first of all, how important five voluntary action has been in ensuring that these people in the so-called vulnerable group also got information and support that is available to them. I would ask further to the uh, information that was made available yesterday in clarification for the shielding group. With regard to this vulnerable group, 
what is the position for them in terms of the support that they currently benefit from and when will this information be communicated to them? I think that would be very important to clarify. Finally, presiding officer, as we reflect on the first stage of the coronavirus pandemic and consider indeed the next steps, it is crystal clear that we must build on the different way of doing business that we have witnessed over the last 12 weeks or so. What we have seen is a laser focus on, deliber on delivery, the stripping back of what can be seen uh, indeed as unnecessary red tape and bureaucracy. We have seen a key role played by a flexible approach to uh, decision making and we have seen indeed a shared common purpose. In the very challenging times that lie ahead, both emotionally, physically, socially, financially, we need to capture the best of what we have witnessed over these weeks and indeed ensure that the new ways of working become the norm and not the exception and that we focus on delivery and not structure and that indeed we seek a reimagining of our society in Scotland. Finally, I would say in conclusion, I'm very pleased indeed to hear of the announcement of the Social Renewal Advisory Board. I wish it well in its endeavours and as the MSP for Cowton Beath constituency, I stand ready to play my part as we move to the new normal. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Julian Martin. Mr Mountain, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This pandemic is like nothing that we have ever known and it's perhaps the biggest threat we will have to face in our lifetimes. Surviving it has been a supreme challenge for many. <clears throat> and the sadness is that some have lost this fight. Presiding Officer, my life has taught me that it is in adversity that the strongest teams are built, built on shared experiences and hardship, which can generate hope and positivity. And that is what has happened in the Highlands. Social distancing has pulled communities together rather than driving them apart, with the focus on helping our neighbours and especially the elderly and most vulnerable. There are examples from all over the Highlands. For example, in Bewley, the Community Council has set up two community larders, one in a phone box and the other in the bus shelter, to help those in need of daily essentials. It is these small acts of kindness in troubled times that prove we care. And we should never overlook that Highlanders and Islanders are known above all else for their generosity. And I'd like to mention briefly Margaret Payne from Advar, who's climbing the height of Sullivan by negotiating 282 trips up the stairs of her Sutherland home. She has just 40 flights of stairs to go before she reaches the summit. The £340,000 she has raised will be a lifeline for the Highland Hospice and the RLNI. This is just one of the fundraising initiatives in the Highlands and Islands, and I'd like to pay tribute, as others have done before me, to all the fundraisers. I know that local charities and trusts are hugely grateful for these funds, especially at a time when income has been hard to generate. And I also would like to welcome the creation of the Scottish Government's £20 million Wellbeing and Resilience Fund, which has secured the future of many charity-run services, including one, the Highland One Stop Shop. This is a service I have long campaigned for, and it couldn't be more important to ensure that vital services continue and that no one is left behind. Presiding officer uh, communities will be the heart of our recovery from the pandemic and we need to build on them. But there are sadly some disappointments. I am disappointed the Highland Council have removed community councils from the planning process. This, to me, is a recipe for disaster. Local communities must always be heard, and this sets a dangerous precedence when planning, planning applications are only scrutinised by a planning officer and the chair of the planning committee. Now, this pandemic has also proved that superfast broadband is far from important. It is critical, critical for businesses, critical for community groups, critical for education, and critical to all members of our society, from grandparents to their great-grandchildren. So I'm hugely saddened that we are less than 12 months away from when the Scottish Government's promised to deliver superfast broadband to every property in Scotland that as yet, work in the Highlands hasn't even started. Indeed, it appears that the Scottish Government's delivery date for the Highlands, instead of being 2021, 
looks more likely to be 2027 or 2028. Well, Mr Lyle, if you want to uh, make an interruption, by all means stand up and, and I'll take uh, it. Richard Lyle. Will, will the member take an intervention? With the greatest respect, I've sat and listened to this every, every month. This is a reserve matter. It is the UK government's fault, not the Scottish government's fault. Mr Mountain. And Mr Lyle, I, I, I take your intervention and, and I listen to that answer every time I heard it. But it was the Scottish Government that made the promise, not the UK Government. And if they can't hold themselves to their own promises, what hope have we got to do in the Highlands? Now, public transport is also a crucial issue for our rural communities, where buses and trains are lifeline services. As lockdown is eased, the demand on these services will increase but bus and train operators will have to keep passenger numbers low to protect public health. There is a genuine concern across the Highlands that low passenger numbers on infrequent services will eventually lead to no services. We do need to hear more from the Scottish Government about how it intends to protect public transport and networks in Scotland, and I hope we will do hear more shortly. Presiding officer, our Highland communities require better connectivity, not less. The Scottish Government does need to deliver on what it's promised. The Scottish Government must also help our remote communities stay connected. Failure to do so will lead to an exodus of people looking for jobs and increasing unemployment across the Highlands. Presiding officer, we Highland and Islanders have shown we have the spirit and determination to survive. And all I implore this Government to do is to deliver what they've promised. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Julian Martin to be followed by Finlay Carson. And Mr Carson will be taking part remotely. Ms Martin. Th thank you, President Officer. Um, this situation has brought real hardship and loss to so many of our constituents. Yet, in amongst the hardship, sorrow and loss, we've found some sparks of positivity that we, as we move out of the crisis, we must hold on to if we're to come out of it and establish a better way of life for our communities. We, uh, the crisis has uh, accelerated innovation in a way that we live our lives. I, I guess we've been forced to accept ideas that have previously been a bit of a struggle to put into action, maybe because of clinging on to uh, the way it's I been, as we've all seen, or that it was just too difficult. Health and care professionals are using new ways of delivering treatment and health consultations, and there's been a rapid, rapid intervention to give those rough sleeping places, uh, those who are rough sleeping places to stay. As a long time advocate of flexible and remote working, we've in one fell swoop destroyed the arguments from naysayers who've long complained it would never work. And we're also saying hello to people as we walk past them in the street. I don't think it's just me. Um, we're kind of checking in on each other and that sp spirit of community is obvious for anyone to see. But for all these small but not insignificant glimmers of hope, this period has also highlighted existing inequalities and deep divisions within Scottish society. COVID-19 does not discriminate amongst us, but that does not mean that we're not all in the same situation. We know that harms caused by the pandemic have not been felt equally. Certain communities have been more badly impacted than others, both in health and economic outcomes. And I commend the Scottish Government for recognising this at every stage of the response and for all the backbenchers who've um, been uh, pushing that as well. The remarkable effort to move people off the streets and to protect tenants facing eviction shows what can be done. But there's a real risk that more people will be swept into homelessness in the months ahead as we start to transition out of lockdown. And we also know that an economic crisis has more severe impact on families with already low incomes and people who were already experiencing the in effects of inequality. And the protective measures of the pandemic response have been hardest on those who live alone, single parent families, those shielding and minority ethnic people, those who don't have their own space, access to outdoor space, those who have precarious employment contracts, those who have no family support are at most, most at risk of both mental and physical illnesses. And we need to see the bold actions of the last four months continue and become the core of our policy making. The Scottish Government's response to this pandemic must put human rights and equality at the core of our recovery plans. 
The Scottish Government have provided um, £350 million of communities funding to address emergency needs during the COVID crisis, but also to build on this work in the long term. Aberdeenshire has been awarded uh, around five and a quarter million of that to support our needs. And although my area doesn't immediately spring to our minds when one thinks of inequality, my constituency in Aberdeenshire East and the wider region of the North East, we also have felt the added weight of the drop in oil prices and the looming Brexit. These, those three things combined um, have led to hu huge job losses already, with I fear many more to come. And I'm not just talking about those directly employed by oil and gas companies, but those in the supply chain and the tangential businesses who employ many more people, including those on low and middle incomes, who will be hit worse. Just transition to a low carbon economy is no longer a future plan, but an urgent pressing need for the people I represent. Mass unemployment in the North East is a real threat. Moving on to the support that my area has already had, um, in the North East we've seen incredible effort to meet the needs of those hit hardest by the pandemic. Aberdeen City have got 90 projects been funded to a value of uh, 702 thousand uh, pounds and through the wellbeing fund and in Aberdeenshire a further 45 projects with a value of 431 thousand pounds have been given support and I know that this funding has made a real and tangible difference to particularly to vulnerable people. Aberdeenshire Council has received 9.2 million um, by the end of July they will have received 19.6 million extra to support their efforts in tackling homelessness um, setting up community hubs, transitioning back into education and enhancing social care provision. And I want to go on record and thank all the officers and employees across all the departments of Aberdeenshire Council who have done an outstanding job of supporting my constituents throughout the pandemic. Many charities and voluntary uh, organisations also, the backbone to, our community, uh, backbone to our communities are also being supported by the Scottish Government. Um, early sh this year, probably one of the last visits I made before lockdown was visiting Aber Aber Necessities uh, to find out more about the incredible work that they do throughout the nor North East to provide support for low-income families with essential items needed to, to care after the babies and children. And they've been awarded £8,000 to work directly with those families in need of uh, any mental health support. And the Gordon Group Riding for Disabled uh, Association and Keith Hall have been given uh, 6,500 to focus on work with um, uh, children who are, uh, have different disabilities and the additional support they need. Um, but I, I want to end with this point, presiding officer. The current COVID-19 outbreak has also exposed the shortcomings of the welfare system, including key gaps in provision for their most vulnerable. And the SNP has consistently called on the UK government to scrap things like the two-child limit, bedroom tax and the benefit cap, as well as pre uh, replace the debt-inducing advances uh, for universal credit with non-repayable hardship grants. And we've seen the last couple of months, the UK government is capable of making changes to welfare provision at pace. Why go back to the precariousness of systems before? We need to ensure that adequate support is available for people when they need it. And as I already said in this chamber in recent weeks, we could do far worse than explore a national basic income in the years ahead. Presiding officer, or better still, devolve all welfare to this place, give us the powers to borrow so we can respond to situations quickly, not just in times of crisis, but as we rebuild our society in the months and years ahead. Thank you. And I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Mr Carson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to recognise the fantastic effort of many of our communities across Scotland and how they've risen to the challenge in these difficult and unprecedented times. As well as recognising what they've done up to now, we also, as a matter of urgency, need to look to the future and ensure that we put in place appropriate policies that empower those same communities to give them the tools to emerge from this crisis, not as they were pre-COVID, but stronger, fitter and more resilient. Last week was Volunteers Week, and in a normal year, I would be out and about in Galloway and Western Fries, highlighting the many activities that our unsung heroes carry out, from the food train to our beach clearing groups, the Castle Douglas Development Trust, Newton Stewart Initiative, and the Strandar Development Trust responsible for our fantastic Oyster Festival, just to name a few. Volunteers are at the heart of our communities, and for that I would like to put on record my thanks to each and every one of them. And this is Carers Week. We've already heard of the amazing job carers do, whether that be in our care homes, in our homes, or in the community. Their hard work, patience, and commitment has certainly been to the forefront of our hearts and minds over the last few worrying months. And that shouldn't change. 
going forward, the sector needs much more positive recognition every day of every week. Our communities have always been important, and as we emerge from lockdown, communities will play an even impo more important role. And we recognise many of the benefits of working from home and in our local communities, and with ongoing potential to enhance our climate and, in many cases, give a boost to mental health and well-being. But we must also recognise that this is not the situation for everyone, and mental health is taking its toll, and more needs to be done to combat that now. Even before COVID-19, there was a recognition uh, for clearer uh, policies on the community being the centre of mental well-being. And the crisis has put a spotlight on mental health and the importance of fostering connections within communities. Support in Mind has been supporting people with poor mental health for nearly 50 years, looking after over 150, uh, uh, 1,500 people every week. And sadly, the crisis has seen an increase in demand with people uh, with poor mental health. Along with the National Rural Mental Health Forum, they've undertaken the Highland and Island Connection Project, test ideas which can illustrate how improved community connections can make a difference to mental health and well-being in different communities. Projects like this clearly show the need to think outside the box about how we can support people right across Scotland, no matter where they live. And many charities are relying on charity shops which are now closed and fundraising events which have now been cancelled. Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland is losing £500,000 a month. And with social distancing measures set to continue for some time, funding is going to be a real issue. As Scotland's largest charity, caring for people with chest, heart and stroke conditions, they play a key role in patient discharge pathways, with their hospital-to-home service helping people discharge from hospitals to get home and stay well. I must admit, the Scottish Government has shown commitment to help charities and services during the pandemic, including welcome support for digital te technology for remote working. But we urgently need a clear long-term strategy and support package for charities, including health charities, to help alleviate pressure on NHS and support our communities when they need it most. Much of the support for our communities to be become resilient in health, social care and well-being would be best delivered if identified and targeted locally. With that in mind, we urgently need greater funding criteria flexibility to allow local authorities to target support to best suit their often unique and diverse needs across their communities. Councils need to act quickly in the interests of their communities and without fear of money being recalled by government. The current schemes, even with the recent broadening of criteria, still see many community groups and businesses falling between the cracks. I have personal trailers with their own, uh, trainers with their own gyms, with no grant awards, beauticians, mobile hairdressers, um, all seeking grant funding and being awarded none. Golf and football clubs at the heart of our communities on their knees. We are told that councils can use discretion. However, councils say that they, are, they have to abide by the rules set by the Scottish Government. Will the Scottish Government allow councils to use their discretion and local knowledge in spending any remaining money which hasn't been claimed? Currently, I believe Dumfries and Galloway Council have in the region of 15 million available. Our communities, individuals and businesses have gone above and beyond to work where they can, volunteering and caring for others where they can, and now making reasonable asks. But can the Scottish Government please make a commitment today to loosen the restrictions and funding criteria and help the businesses, organisations and ultimately families in our communities who have spent the past three months helping the government? Surely that's not too much to ask. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr Carson. And I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Claire Baker. Mr Gibson, please. Presiding officer, I would like to thank those organisations who have ventured their views and positions on where Scotland should go from here. In line with the focus of this debate, as we slowly re-emerge from full lockdown, I'm particularly sympathetic to Royal Blind and Scottish World Blind's suggestions that we all have a part to play in helping visually impaired people with social distancing. It may sound obvious, but if you can't see how far other people are from you, how can you keep your distance? As a society, we have a duty to accommodate anyone with impairments, and in the aftermath of this crisis, we will have to take extra care and be more proactive in that. Self-isolation and anxiety about going out are concerns for some people at any time, but especially now that previously trusted surroundings are changing. In the wider social care context, Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland refers not to how we can make the pandemic a, 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 an opportunity to do better, but what we need to do if we don't want to lose excellent services already in place, a very important dose of reality. 
One of the Scottish Government's key policies is promoting and facilitating independent living within the community. If at home and near your support network, we want you to be able to live independently. Having high quality care in the community and discharge services throughout Scotland is important to facilitate this. Health and social care partnerships do much of this work, but the reality is that we need for specialised charity services such as chest, heart and stroke, Macmillan Cancer Support, Marie Curie and similar support providers remains. They make a real difference to people's lives and their value cannot be underestimated. There are people in my own constituency who benefit from the hospital to home service that Chest, Heart and Stroke runs with NHS Air Shanaan and the charity runs a stroke survivor support group from Largs Library. The Scottish Government recognises the value of charity organisations community support and therefore the £50 million wellbeing fund to help them support those most vulnerable to the virus and the £20 million third sector resilience fund to help secure continued operation throughout the crisis are crucial. In addition, third sector organisations can dip into £10 million of Scottish Government's £70 million food fund set up to help address food insecurity, especially for older people and families unable to rely on free school meals. Providing assistance in times of crisis is ongoing. Now is the time to look at the mid to long term prospects of a third sector and how we can help them continue, adapt and develop their support services in this changed circumstance. I have had several exchanges with the ministers and councillors giving evidence to the Local Government and Communities Committee on how important it is that, they, that when discretionary powers along with funding are devolved to local authorities, they should take that responsibility and execute it flexibly. It is important that misinformation does not take place and ministers must be clear to those allocating funds what discretion they have to ensure the right funding goes to those who need it and expectations of others are properly managed. During the crisis, crucial work has indeed been undertaken at the heart of communities, and I'm grateful to North Eastern Council locally and the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. One element is community planning, and from 2017 onwards, locality planning partnerships have functioned in North Ayrshire based on community empowerment, and I'm sure such partnerships have filled similar roles across Scotland. Any local authority that hasn't channelled its efforts into communities on a locality level may well have missed a trick. Community planning partners are tasked with making plans which describe local priorities, what empowerments are planned and when these will be made. It aims to meet the needs and ambitions of local people so that voices are, their voices are especially important. With representation from community councils, the local authority, health and social care partnerships and community groups, decisions and recommendations are made regarding proposed developments, funding for community groups, how to help tackle social isolation and other key priorities identified per locality. There are six partnerships in North Ayrshire, four of which are in my constituency of Cunningham North. Garnet Valley, North Coast, Three Towns and Arne. Island proofing enabled Arne to its own locality and rightly so. This local element has proven very effective in these times of crisis. Since the beginning of the coronavirus outbreak, locality planning partnerships have played a key role in North Ayrshire where volunteers and council officers, particularly from the Connected Communities team, have made good use of such structures to put local COVID-19 support hubs in place. The speed at which these hubs were organised in lockdown was impressive and they have undertaken phenomenal work for which local residents are very grateful. The COVID-19 community hubs provide a local point of contact for any community need arising and they have responded with advice, signposting, referral and the tasking of local volunteers. While digital resources such as websites and social media pages are not as costly to maintain and update, only councils can assess whether keeping physical locality hubs uh, open after the pandemic uh, in each locality and, is and whether or not this will be justifiable from a budgetary perspective. The move from planning activities to coordinating the hands-on services directly within communities will by now have amassed a wealth of experience and processes to hopefully be harnessed in future. Last week was Volunteers Week and those who enjoy volunteering at any time will wish to continue playing their part. And we all appreciate the efforts of Alex Cole Hamilton in this particular regard. However, I also recognise that councils should not rely too heavily on volunteers. Community empowerment cannot become an excuse to simply leave local communities to it, and support both from councils and government remains critical. Presiding officer, COVID-19 has brought much insecurity not only to Scotland, but across the world, and we know that life will not be the same for a very long time to come. Getting our finances ready is only one aspect of this. The way we help people and communities thrive is a matter of redesigning how we deliver services effectively. This requires dialogue and consultation with those working on the ground, and I trust that the Scottish Government will continue to facilitate that. Thank you very much. And I call Claire Baker to be followed by Gail Ross. And Ms Ross will be contributing remotely.
Thank you, President Officer. As almost everyone has commented this afternoon, the community response to this pandemic has been instrumental in supporting people through this and will continue to be so as we move through the stages of lifting lockdown. Across my region, I have seen a huge commitment from community groups and volunteers to provide emergency support, and it is right that we recognise their contribution. For the debate, we've had briefings from health charities who are continuing to deliver essential services that support and complement the work of the NHS, and a few members have mentioned this. But as charities, they are facing huge challenges as their income has dropped dramatically. We must ensure that ongoing arrangements are in place so these critical services can continue. The research published last week by SCVO shows two in five charities are already reporting an increase in demand and a post-lockdown surge in demand is expected for many services. 30% are predicting a drop in income and half of those charities surveyed anticipate that they will run out of cash within six months. While it is welcome that emergency funding arrangements for many organisations was introduced, the fact is that most charities rely on a mix of income to survive and without the ability to continue fundraising activities or other income generating services, it's only a matter of time before the reserves will dry up. In the first stages of lockdown, the focus was on meeting immediate need, but three months on, financial short-term shocks are being replaced with longer-term concerns over sustainability and how to adapt services so they can continue to deliver. The immediate measures taken, including the resilience funding, have an end date, and now we need to consider how longer term funding needs will be met. With more than a third of charities having less than four months expenditure in reserve, they are asking what will happen when the emergency funding stops. Many of these organisations are concerned that restrictions will not be lifted in time for them to remedy the fallen income and that they will not be able to survive this period. Charities and community groups supporting youth work and the creative sector continue to work to provide services which improve quality of life across Scotland, often having to find innovative solutions, but they are feeling the impact like everyone else. In terms of moving past the lockdown period, 70% of youth work leaders expect cuts to services and budgets, and many are asking how we will support the needs of young people post-lockdown. Half of our independent museums are based in towns and villages across Scotland, face running out of money within six months, and 90% of heritage charities are reporting a high to moderate risk of their long-term viability. While they are not the responsibility of the Cabinet Secretary today, if we are talking about the well-being of our communities, culture is an important factor in supporting community co cohesion and placemaking. I have previously raised some questions regarding the process for distributing funds to community organisations in response to the pandemic. And while I fully recognise the rapid response, which has been described today as cutting through the red tape, there were concerns raised with me about transparency around both the application process and the distribution of funds. Resources were awarded before guidance was put in place, and this did raise some questions. I wouldn't question the integrity of anyone who received support, but the second tranche gives an opportunity to reach out to other communities and ensure an equal distribution. And I look forward to looking at the maps that the Cabinet Secretary described as being published today to, say, to see some positive news. Um, yes, but Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure that we'll continue to work with all the partners to ensure that we can plug any gaps if there are any. But uh, we can't give false promises, but I hope that reassures you that we're wanting to make sure that there's no gaps. Ms Baker. I, I do welcome this, and I've had extensive correspondence with the Cabinet Secretary about this, so I do welcome that response. Um, there are huge challenges in meeting the demand in the longer term. More people are reliant on welfare support and are in need of community resources for support. The Scottish Government needs to be looking to the next phase and provide information on what additional support is needed and when this will be made available. And I'm sure that's key questions for the advisory group on social renewal described by the Cabinet Secretary today. We also need to recognise that while the pandemic has changed lives everywhere, the impact of coronavirus are being felt more acutely by certain groups and those living on low incomes are being disproportionately affected. Those already living in poverty are under further financial pressure and levels of poverty and child poverty are rising fast in some of our poorest communities. We have seen unprecedented levels of food insecurity and a third of Scots have concerns over the ability to pay for food and other essential items. We are already seeing increased numbers of self-employed and those newly applying for universal credit and others experiencing unseen poverty issues and accessing food banks. 
Many charities are working hard to provide emergency food and support, but increasing numbers are now reliant on these services and demand is only expected to increase as lockdown eases and unemployment is expected to rise. As we approach the school holidays, I have previously asked the Cabinet Secretary about additional support for all local authorities to deliver the free school me meals programme over the summer, and I hope she will um, consider this. She has talked about a cash-first approach, and I think this could be part of that plan. Uh, the briefing from the Poverty Alliance includes a number of recommendations for the Government to consider in the short, medium and long term, and I hope we will soon see the publication of an appropriate action plan to support our communities out of the current crisis. I'd also just like to say a little about the positive action we've seen during this period. In addition to the valuable community services which people are increasingly relying on throughout the pandemic, I'm sure we all know individuals and groups are responding to the lockdown and working within communities to raise spirits. In my own region, we've seen local musicians playing in the streets and outside care homes so residents can experience live music. We've also seen a band of superhero runners and walkers taking to the street daily in areas across Fife, bringing joy to children and adults alike. These benefits of community action, however small, continue to be important, and I want to thank all of those who are part of the positive community response to this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I call Gail Ross. Ms Ross is the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Ross. Thank you, President Officer. I would also like to begin, as so many of my other colleagues have done, by thanking all the individuals and community groups that have stepped forward in this time of crisis to help support and provide for those in need. There are some amazing community-led initiatives all over Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. People just getting on and doing what needs done, sourcing funding and volunteering in the face of extreme adversity. I also want to thank everyone across the constituency for being so patient and understanding and sticking with the lockdown guidance. It's because of you that we find ourselves in the position of having a relatively low number of confirmed cases in the region. All over the country, we have many challenges to overcome and some communities we know will be changed forever. But we have an opportunity now to ensure that the change is as positive as we can make it. There's no doubt that our communities have risen to this challenge like they have at so many other times. And it's because of the very nature of our communities that we find ourselves in the position of being able to look at what positive change might be. Design officer, the local community resilience groups that have been formed have looked at things from a different perspective. The way that they have operated is the way that the community planning partnerships were initially modelled. We cannot afford to lose this momentum. Their energy and the way of working must be harnessed. Community planning done from a grassroots level, done by those on the ground with the contacts working in the sectors. We also have a chance to look at things like the city region deal, funding that has been committed but not spent. Have our priorities changed? How is that money being spent? Is it being spent to the benefit of all our communities? This crisis should prompt us to look at past commitments and ask how the whole region is served to ensure that our remote rural communities are now included. And I must say one of the catalysts of this change was the Scottish Government's Supporting Communities Fund. This began the process of drawing together key anchor organisations to get the money to the right places, and it has been a huge success in my constituency. I was also delighted to see the second phase of the Aspiring Communities Fund announced this week. These awards were based on the success and outcomes of the last round, so it's a huge tribute to the community groups involved to have been recognised again. But it's not just the public and third sector that have come to the fore during the last few months. Dunray, one of the biggest employers in the constituency with around 1,500 people on site in normal times, has joined with the North Highland Initiative, Diageo and Glenmorangie to provide small community groups with funding for projects to help vulnerable people. They're also working with the NHS, the Highland Council and the Caithness and North Sutherland Regeneration Partnership to develop resilience within the community and ensure sustainability of services in the future. Design officer, this crisis has made a lot of us work in different ways and it has made us look at what is important in our lives and how we value and spend our time. 
we've been in, we've been forced to embrace technology in ways that seemed almost impossible a couple of months ago. As you can see, I'm making a speech to the Chamber of the Scottish Parliament from my own home, which is brilliant. But undoubtedly, there are some instant instances in which virtual working is not possible nor desirable. But I have spoken to quite a few businesses in the constituency that are also looking at more home and virtual working as the norm going forward. And it's given those businesses the opportunities to look at the use of technology. Why can't people now relocate to the Highlands without the need for being based in a city? We need to ensure connectivity, both physical and digital, is fit for our virtual working because you can only make use of the technology if it is there. So investment in connectivity in rural areas will ensure that we can connect to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. And I'd like to point out that the current R100 programme in the north is affected by an ongoing legal case. So Mr Mountain, as convener of the Rural Committee, should be aware of this. President Officer, it is well known that our communities in Caithness, Sutherland and Ross and across the wider Highland region are very reliant on tourism. The businesses involved in this sector are devastated by a huge loss of income in what is an already short season. And they are looking for detailed guidance on how and when they can safely start operations again. And the emphasis here has to be on safely. But some residents are very worried about what they see as an influx of people coming to the area, possibly bringing the virus with them and spreading it around some very fragile communities with high numbers of elderly people. And I don't blame them for being nervous at all. There has been an increase in people travelling to the area over the last couple of weeks with little thought for the people that live here. And these communities are left feeling like they have no voice. And this is not essential travel. And people all across the Highlands that followed the lockdown guidance are right to expect others to do the same. There's a fine balance between keeping our communities safe and becoming unwelcoming in the longer term. And I've heard really worrying reports of hoteliers and hospitality workers that have been verbally abused, being told that they will be to blame if the virus is brought up here. And they're feeling quite threatened. But the feedback that I'm getting from tourism representatives and workers is that it all hinges on messaging. Messaging from the Scottish Government to business, messaging from business to the communities, and messaging from the communities to the people that we want to return here when the time is right. We have to make sure that tourists and visitors are aware that although we are currently close to people travelling here for leisure purposes, this will not last forever. Tourists and visitors will be welcome when they come back, and it's essential for the Highland economy that they do. So let's make sure that our famous Highland welcome is not lost in amongst the current concern and worry. Let's move forward in a positive manner and make sure our community spirit continues in the way that we have seen over the past few months, President Officer. Thank you very much, Ms Ross. I move to closing speeches and I call Sarah Boyack to close for Labour six minutes or thereabouts, Ms Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I refer members to my register of interest in relation to my former employment? Um, like others, I want to agree that COVID-19 has actually highlighted the strengths of our communities. Because in the face of the pandemic, communities have come together to support each other, whether it's local groups delivering food parcels to vulnerable people, people providing support online, and key workers keeping vital services going. Our communities are in some ways more connected than ever today, and this is our chance to reflect on how we can support them and strengthen those connections in the, first, in the coming months. Since March, we have seen communities adapt quickly and in solidarity. We've seen councils transitioning to deliver their services in ways no one would have imagined four months ago. Staff have been redeployed, businesses supported. But what coronavirus has also done is to highlight the structural weaknesses in our society and the lack of a safety net for far too many. We knew that the gig economy was bad for individual people, but it's now clear how its negative impact disproportionately affects women and young people. We knew that working conditions across the social care sector varied, but now we know how poorly paid and insecure many social care contracts are. And we knew that councils were struggling to fund services, and we can see just how vital those services are to protecting our communities. And as Pauline McNeill highlighted, we're now beginning to see the negative economic impact of the pandemic as increasing numbers of jobs are lost and people lose our their incomes. 
So this debate has got to focus on the next steps for our communities. And like others, I want to thank all those in the third sector and charities for the work they've done to date to support some of the most vulnerable in our communities and also to acknowledge the amazing contribution of volunteers. There's been a theme of colleagues' speeches today about the inspiring work we've seen in our communities and that has to go on the record. But Claire Baker's points about the vulnerability of our charities are really important. The financial vulnerability. The fact that a third of our charities have less than four months reserves is an alarm call and we need to see a long-term plan to support them. So I welcome the comment from the Cabinet Secretary that she is committed to there being no geographical gaps in support. Having looked at some of the grants that have gone thus far, that's something we need to look at going forward. One of the things I think we also need to do is to look at outreach services from our local authorities, for example, social work and how they connect people who've been shielding for weeks now and who still have the challenge of getting through the next few weeks. The points made by Anas Sarwar about communications are absolutely vital and I think they reinforce the points about the need for adequate funding so that we can see those services reaching the people that need them. There's also been homelessness almost eradicated that used to be in the too difficult category. But as Pauline McNeill and Andy Whiteman have argued, we need to see more action going forward because there were many people who are on the verge who will be at risk as jobs are lost. And those who were in the verge of eviction before the lockdown will, as it stands, lose that protection against eviction at the end of September. So there's a need for action now. And I think Pauline McNeill's bill will be critical to help prevent homelessness and ensure fair rents going forward. But if you look at Edinburgh, I, I was speaking to councillors just this week, I'm told that we have 1,200 households who are not homeless, but they are living in unsuitable accommodation. And that's not 1,200 people, that's 1,200 households. So there's much more that needs to be done to provide long-term suitable and affordable housing. So like others, Graeme Simpson and Polly McNeill, I welcome the publication today of the report by the Chartered Institute of Housing, SFHA and Shelter, which asks us to look at the range of affordable housing needs we have across Scotland and in our communities. And I know from talking to Homes for Scotland that their members and the construction industry are ready to start building again when it's safe. So there's an appetite there to get going. We need the long-term commitment and that needs to be cross-party. We are facing unprecedented times, as colleagues across the chambers have said, but the poorest and the most vulnerable communities are those who are experiencing them the hardest. We got a briefing last week from the Trussell Trust to highlight that 62% increase in food parcels given to children. And I know from talking to local council colleagues that they are really worried that they are facing huge financial pressures about continuing to provide support going forward. Like colleagues today, I couldn't stand up in Parliament without acknowledging the Black Lives Matter movement. We've seen protests across the world, including here in Scotland, but we've also seen how COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted on black Asian members in our communities. And we've seen how services are staffed by members of those communities. So I'd ask the Cabinet Secretary in her summing up to address the concerns of Edinburgh's Unison members who contacted me this week because they're worried about the lack of guidance for councils to support those black and ethnic minority staff who are doing vital work. So I'd be keen to know if the Cabinet Secretary is looking at producing a race equality impact assessment and action plan so that we come out of the pandemic with health and safety at work central to employers' concerns and building in the evidence we now have of the experience from this pandemic on those communities. Now is the time not just to condemn outright occurrences of racism, but to address the structural inequalities which prevent, present barriers to minority communities. We've got to listen. There might be difficult conversations, but we must learn and we must build back better. And finally, we need to address the inequalities that scar too many of our communities. The impact of the pandemic on older people, on women, on people from low-income communities, people with disabilities. We don't just need a better safety net. We need to build back a better equality right across society with rights that people can actually hold and see being implemented. So in closing, I want to echo the points that both Pauline McNeill and Anas Sarwar made. In the weeks to come, we must also think about 
the impact of the pandemic on children and young people and make sure that we protect their futures. Make sure that we look at education and employment and the support that those young people can get in their communities so that the pandemic does not hold them back. It's not just about a new normal. It's about building a better, more equal society. We all need to play our part in that. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call on Jeremy Balfour to close for the Conservatives. Mr Balfour is contributing remotely. Mr Balfour, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I think it's been a really helpful debate. I think there's been quite a number of common themes that come through all speakers uh, so far uh, this afternoon. I do believe that we need a medium and a long-term uh, solution to many of the issues that have been raised. Uh, we cannot resolve some of the long-term issues immediately, but we do need to start addressing them and addressing them constructively and hopefully cross-party. If I can perhaps pick up three uh, main themes that have come across uh, to me this afternoon. The first is in regard to the third sector. We have heard many uh, examples um, across Scotland um, of those from the third sector who are doing a remarkable job. And I know within my own region here of Lothian of many groups uh, who have come and uh, filled a gap which have helped people uh, who have been most in need at this very difficult time. However, I do think there is an issue in regard to how do we fund the third sector going forward and what place does the third sector play within our society? As someone who uh, is a volunteer, as someone who has worked in the third sector, um, I understand, and I'm sure government understands, the financial pressures that many groups are under. I do think we need to look at how do we fund third sector groups, particularly smaller charities working within local communities. Um, too often, the money goes to the user suspects and as much as they do need it and we need to support those groups, often that money does not trickle down to the grassroots. And I think this is an opportunity uh, for us all to, to pause and look at how we spend the money and how do people apply that, for that money? Um, do they have too many forms to fill out? Uh, how difficult it is, particularly for small charities, which have been run by volunteers to access the money that they need to make a difference within their society. The second theme I think has come clearly out of today's debate is what, how do we help the most vulnerable, particularly those who have been homeless or maybe become homeless in the next few months. I think Graham Simpson is absolutely right. We need to get uh, houses built and we need to get the construction uh, industry back working here in Scotland as soon as possible. The, we will not solve this crisis unless we have the appropriate housing. And there are a number of houses which are so close to completion, which will then free up other houses and allow the market to take place. And I do hope that the Scottish Government will address this in the very near future. But we have heard also about the uh, remarkable work that has been done around homelessness, both here in Edinburgh, uh, Glasgow and other parts of Scotland. And I too welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary's uh, starting up of a homeless working group again. I, I suppose my question around that, and perhaps maybe can be dealt with in summing up, is what is the time scale for that working group? Uh, we've heard from a number of speakers that the hotels that are being used here in the city may come to an end within the next few weeks or certainly within the next couple of months. And the danger is that those individuals who have been helped in those hotels simply end back on the streets. And so I'd be interested to know from the Cabinet Secretary in her summing up is how quickly will this working group report and how quickly uh, can Scottish Government, uh, local authorities and the third sector work together on this so that we have a proper solution. Uh, finally, I would like to turn to those who are shielding. Um, I understand to some degree why the government is being cautious, but I do think we have to understand the pressure we are putting on uh, individuals and families who are shielding at present, particularly those who are disabled 
or have disabled members of their family? How are we going to get more people back into employment if they are being shielded? How are we going to get people to go to college and university in September if they are still shielding or have these restrictions? In regard to practicalities, I have um, a constituent here in Edinburgh who is shielding but has two children who are at school. Will they be allowed to return to school? If not, how will their education be affected and how will um, they be educated? Will it simply be done remotely or other, other ways of doing it? I think we have to look at the impact shielding is having on many families and many individuals and to see whether we are moving quick enough on this. I think our speakers, Deputy Presiding Officer, have recognised uh, the challenges that we face over the next months and years. Uh, however, I am confident that our communities with the right support can um, be challenged and addressed on these. And I hope that the third sector will play the role that they have been playing already, but in a greater way in regard to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Balfour. And I call on Shirley Ann Sunwell to close with the Government. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I begin by thanking everyone for their contributions today and for the very positive and constructive suggestions that we've had from all the parties as we look to move forward. As we've heard today, this pandemic has been a universal experience, but the harms caused by the pandemic have certainly not been experienced equally. The direct and indirect health impacts, the economic and social impacts, none of these have been felt equally across society with some groups particularly affected. It is the social impacts in particular that I and Aileen Campbell want to address while also focusing on the interrelated nature of these harms. In our response to the pandemic, we acted quickly. And as Aileen Campbell pointed out earlier, we've done this to ensure that the immediate needs were addressed. This crisis has, as many members have pointed out, highlighted existing inequality and poverty. Some of these inequalities have persisted stubbornly over decades. We simply cannot allow these to be made worse over the long term by the impact of the pandemic, which is why we're taking forward our social renewal work to lock in the progress made and the good work we've seen and to grasp the opportunities as we move to recovery and renewal. We are aware that this will not be easy and that there are many challenges ahead. At a recent roundtable, stakeholders shared with Aileen Campbell and I that we should see this recovery as a healing process, that we need to heal the trust in our social contract. Stakeholders also said that there have been some great examples of this already. And to quote directly, organisations and people need to drop their egos, lose their logos and their silos to get jobs done. When this crisis hit, we proved we can change rapidly and improve outcomes. And I don't want this change to be a temporary change, but to be something that is permanent and sustainable. And many of the contributions today have pointed to how this can be done. Graham Simpson pointed to the importance of planning and communities that have facilities. That importance of the outdoors and green space has been much valued by people uh, during the last couple of months and much missed by those who do not have the chance to use it. And as Kevin Stewart pointed out in an intervention, um, we should also add the importance of building standards to that as well. I would say to Graeme Simpson, however, I'm disappointed by his unfair characterisation of what's happened with the child poverty report. The government has been busy supporting the very communities that we have been talking about all afternoon, and it has been unable to make sure that the report has been completed on the timescales that we had wished. But we will absolutely report as soon as is practical. Pauline McNeill raised, again, a number of very important points. She was the first of many members to talk about and pay tribute to the community groups in her area, some of them well established, some of them brand new. And it would be remiss of me, presiding officer, at this point not to uh, pay tribute to one in my own local area, the West Fife Support for the Vulnerable Shield Group, which is one of many that have sprung up in local communities. Ms McNeill also pointed out quite rightly that we need to be aware of how we treat our older people in our society. 
That's something which we need to learn lessons on um, all the time, but have been brought into great focus during this pandemic. And particularly, she also pointed to the impact on young people, the impact of the job losses and the importance of looking particularly at the young shielded group. And I will absolutely take on that challenge that she gave us to be bold and innovative as we look forward. And as Aileen Campbell, I think, pointed out, we will look at the ideas that she has uh, suggested already today. Andy Whiteman um, talked about the importance of ensuring that we protect tenants. I won't rehash the details of past uh, bills. Mr Whiteman, I'm sure, and the rest of the chambers will be glad to know. But I will give him the assurance that we will look at any bold and workable solution that comes forward as this government is determined to support our tenants, as we have done already during this pandemic. Alec Cole Hamilton and indeed many others talked about the acts of kindness that we've seen from individuals, from community groups, from local businesses. And I would also add many faith groups into that. And again, the I would give the example of the Dunfermline Central Mosque from my own constituency. They have been a shining light uh, within a very, very dark period that our country has experienced. And those acts of kindness have been much welcome and much appreciated by many. He also spoke, as did others, about the resilience of many of our communities and about that importance of localism, something that Ruth Maguire also pointed to. And that importance of localism and empowering our communities, something which again has been much talked about, but we must ensure happens in practice much better than it has done in the past. Ruth Maguire also um, asked about the membership of the advisory board. I would stress that we have not sent out all the invitations for the advisory boards um, as yet, uh, but I would confirm uh, that Tressa Burke from the Glasgow Disability Alliance has accepted an invitation uh, to take part and more invites are due to go out over the next few days. And we will also look very carefully at the circles which will flow from the advisory uh, board to ensure that we have um, representation from as broad a spectrum within Scottish society as possible. Certainly. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. It's just a quick question on the advisory board. Uh, will there be some way in which it can report to Parliament rather than just straight to government? Surely the answer, Marville. Well, it's certainly something that we're very keen to ensure is as open as possible in its working. Eileen Campbell and I will give serious consideration about how we can ensure that Ms Campbell and I are continuously updating um, Parliament at key stages um, in its work. And I'm sure there will be a number of uh, committees that will also look to find out more about the, the board in due course. Anis Sarwar uh, also dealt with uh, many important issues, and I'll try to cover as many as possible as I can. Uh, he spoke about income maximisation and the importance of that, and that's why the government has been giving money to citizens of East Scotland, amongst others, uh, to um, encourage people to find out what they are eligible for. A particularly an important point when many people um, are new to the benefit and welfare system and do need that additional assistance. He spoke about uh, shield, the shielding group, as did Jeremy Balfour, and of course, the First Minister has um, reassured the shielding group that we are looking to give much more individualised advice as we move through this process. He also quite rightly pointed out uh, the impact of the coronavirus on the black and minority ethnic communities. He spoke about the community networks and the established contacts uh, that many of the organisations have in this, and he mentioned Bemis in particular on that. Um, yes, uh, Bemis um, have been successful in um, receiving money from the Scottish Government, and indeed 27 applicants in round one of the Wellbeing Fund said that their target group was for black and minority ethnic communities, and round two of that fund are, active, uh, are under active consideration. Uh, I would also um, stress uh, that the um, announcement made by the First Minister on the Expert Reference Group will meet tomorrow, which is another important aspect as we move forward and look at the implications of COVID-19 on the black and minority ethnic communities. One of the aspects I understand that they have on their agenda to deal with Sarah Boyack's point is around um, health and safety and how to support the workforce and risk assessment. So hopefully that gives some reassurance that that's actually been looked at uh, tomorrow as well. But Anna Sarwa rightly pointed out that we also need to look at the structural inequalities uh, that we have to challenge ourselves on as well as just what's been happening in the global pandemic that we're currently in. Gillian Martin spoke about the flexible and home working, as did uh, Gail Ross. 
and it is absolutely important that we learn the lessons from this and Gail Ross is a prime example of how this uh, can work in practice um, and how this can be used. Gillian Martin also spoke about the importance of equalities and human rights and whether that would be embedded in the work that we're doing and again I would uh, reassure her hopefully that uh, the um, Angela O'Hagan has also accepted an invitation uh, to be on the advisory group. Uh, this is obviously something uh, she is very um, expert in, as are many other members on the group too. Uh, Claire Baker spoke about the uh, pressure that's on the third sector, as did many others. Uh, yes, the Scottish Government uh, did introduce £350 million of funding to support communities, and that did include to support for the third sector. And we have opened up a dialogue with SCVO and others about what that future focus of support will look like. And we all are also actively considering what support for summer holidays will look like uh, for children and young people um, as we move forward on that point. Uh, presiding officer, hopefully um, I've covered most of the points that um, people um, have raised um, during the debate. Uh, I would say that we are launching today a bold policy and practice platform for social renewal, one which takes account of people and their lived experience. We do intend to build on the collaboration that has already been taking place. We don't want to simply reinvent the wheel or have meetings for meetings sake. An important example of how we do this is the importance that we will place on lived experience. One example which we will use during this is the social security experience panels. They've obviously been involved with the development of devolved social security policy design and delivery and that's been people with lived experience having a real influence and we want to build on this and see how we can use the experience panels and indeed other ways to learn from that lived experience as we go forward. We've set out a clear and ambitious vision of what we are looking for during this process. It's about a more equal, more prosperous and socially just Scotland and our board will be guided to do so. Our work will have to be evidence-based and it will be guided by the local responses that we have. We must be mindful of the financial realities, of course, of our times and that our outcomes must be sustainable. And as part of this work, we intend to get a better understanding of what has worked, where are the gaps, and if we had a second chance, what might we have done differently? This will take account of this learning and will be used to form our future approach. Presiding officer, today we've set out a vision to renew Scotland and to make a first step towards healing the harms caused by COVID-19 in our communities. We speak often of renewal or building back better. Our stakeholders have challenged us to build forwards better, and I think that's something that we can all support. Thank you. Thank you, and that concludes our debate on COVID-19 and the next steps. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 21993 on designation of a lead committee. Could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move this motion? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. And there is just the one question as a result of today's business. The question is that Motion 21993 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the, committee of the Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.